This podcast is recorded on stolen and unceded Aboriginal land. We acknowledge the First Nations and elders of this country and we join their calls for justice. Serious danger, Australia. It's Serious Danger, it's Tom and Emerald bonus episode previewing a wonderful candidate running for the Victorian Greens in the upcoming election. We should say this whole thing is made possible with the help of the Green Institute and produced by Michael the Griff Griffin. You know that. Uh, but we are so close. Less than a month from November 26th, a.k.a. my birthday, a.k.a. the election. Everyone's excited, uh, equally excited about both events. People can't believe their luck. <laughs> Daniel Andrews has an 11-seat buffer in the lower house. Uh, it holds 55 of the 88 seats. <laughs> the coalition has to win 18 seats to turf Labor out. Uh, which is not going to happen. And there is a real chance that the Greens are going to do really well at this election. Gabrielle D. Vietri is running for the seat of Richmond. That is smack bang in Adam Band's federal seat of Melbourne. We're talking Fitzroy, Collingwood, Clifton Hill, you know, those kind of suburbs. Fitzroy uh, recently elected the coolest suburb in the world, I think. I think in the world. maybe In the Just world. Fitzroy. They must not have heard of any Brisbane suburbs. Strange. A uh, lot of focus on Richmond because the sitting Labor MP Richard Wynn is retiring. In 2018, the Greens got a primary vote of 34%. The Greens have come second in the seat every single election since 2002. Everyone's saying this is the year, baby. This is the time when Richmond goes green, which would be really cool. Uh, we thought we'd have a chat to Gab about her campaign, who she is, what she's fighting for, how the campaign is going, what she's hearing on the doors and stuff. I promise if you're outside of Victoria, it's not hopefully not too Victorian. There are insights and lessons yeah. to be learned here for other green campaigns across the country. And also reflecting on Gab's experience being the mayor of the Yarra City Council, which was the first ever majority Greens government anywhere in Australia and potentially the world, according to this interview. Mm. It's pretty exciting. Yeah, some, uh, some spicy discussions there. And, yeah, don't worry, there is an appearance from, like, Queensland Greens, door knocking <laughs> Greensland strategy chat and Terry Butler and Trevor Evans. <laughs> so, you know, should I also say, like, sorry, my voice changes halfway through because my computer had a meltdown and my video is also going to change back and then back again. So, you know, yeah, just a bit of fun is, feel. Is everything okay? Is your computer exploded or what's going on? That's not exploded. It's warm. Maybe it's just too hot. It's pretty hot today. It's so, so damn hot. Hot like this discussion about Victorian state politics. Here's our chat with Gabrielle. <laughs> Go. We should maybe start. We're less than a month away from Election Day on November 26th, which is my birthday. Uh, but you were telling us before we started recording, you're waking up every day with excitement, with hope and joy and the prospect of victory in your heart. What are you experiencing? Have there been crazy experiences on the campaign trails, stuff that's come up door knocking? What's the, what's the vibe on the streets of Richmond? There is so much optimism when we open the door, when, when we open the doors, when, when people open the doors to us door knocking, so many people just say, look, don't waste your time. You've got me. Like I'm already a voter. How, how can I get involved? We've had that so many times and it's just so exciting because people are very confident in the idea of voting Greens here. Um, you can really, really feel the excitement um, from the federal election flowing over into the state election and people are really excited about the idea of a really strong progressive crossbench. So we're waking up every morning for the last few months actually with a slight kind of excited shake. And it's just getting more exciting. I mean, this morning we had um, in the space of 12 hours uh, four, four articles that mention that the Greens are going to take Richmond. It's really, really slated as the Greens' next big win and it's, I think it's been a long time coming. I think this sheet, seat should have been green already. Um, mm. But this is the, t- the chance for us to um, get another Greens MP in Parliament and strengthen that crossbench and hold Labor to account. Is anyone being angry at you? Is anyone going, no, Richmond will never be Labor? Anyone being angry or like slammed a door in your face? Any of that kind of juicy stuff? That's well, that's the kind of current movie we like. You kind of see the like the hot spots, like those maps showing where the support is. Um, mm. and you can definitely feel it corresponding on the ground. Like we're we're knocking we we have a huge field campaign. We're knocking on almost every single knockable door in the electorate. So we're getting mm. a really good impression of what people are, what people care about, the struggles that they're facing right now, the pressures that they're facing, um, and how they're going to vote. And you can see in that Labor hotspot, you can feel it on the ground. You've got people opening the door going, oh, yeah, I normally vote Labor, which is, you know, a great conversation starter for us. <laughs> um, 
and, um, you know, and, and almost everywhere else you get, you know, I'm a green supporter. I voted for Adam. I'll vote for you. It feels great. Very exciting. That's so good. What do you what yes. do you say? Like, what's the um, what lines are you kind of using when people open that conversation with? Yeah, I, I normally am a am a Labor voter. Um, what are you finding is changing their mind? It's interesting to know what gets them voting Labor. So to yeah. kind of find out a little bit more, and and I think as well, like people vote Labor historically. And they're mm-hmm. not actually we're finding they're not actually too attached to voting Labor. Yeah. And and for those people who have been voting Labor for a very long time, it's important to kind of make the distinction. This isn't the party of Gough Whitlam anymore. Um, Labor have actually, um, you know, in the eight years of government, have really failed Victorians in terms of housing affordability, in terms of climate, in terms of the cost of living. There's so many levers they could have been pulling that they haven't been pulling because they're too concerned about their vested interests. And when you start cracking open the conversation and talking about how the Labor Party takes donations from the fossil fuels industry and they take donations from property developers, that starts to link in with the problems that they're seeing around the flooding and the and the fire threats, the the, the cost of living and and luxury apartments going up everywhere mm. while they're struggling to pay rent. So mm. they're kind of like linking it into their lives, and yeah. also the the this idea that like here in Richmond. It's a contest between Labor and the Greens. You're never going to yes. get a Liberal candidate getting up as, as hard as he's trying, bless his cotton <laughs> socks. Um, <laughs> and they have a choice here. They could either elect, you know, a, a backbencher who'll vote to keep rents high and who'll vote to keep drilling for gas near the 12 apostles, or they can elect a strong independent voice, someone who's been living here for 20 years, who's always fought for this community, to push the next government further and faster on the things that matter to them. Mm. That's yeah. interesting. That's interesting, isn't it? Right? Because obviously Richard Wynne, pretty high profile housing minister, but yes, you're. I assume the challenger, the the Labor candidate, the lady who was running to replace him as the Labor MP for the seat of Richmond, she's she would be a first time MP, so she's not obviously not going to be necessarily if she was elected, be immediately appointed to the cabinet or have the same kind of profile that he has. He's been in there for fucking forever, right? That's right. Yeah, he's been in for 24 years. He's Whoa. been the housing minister, the planning minister. In yep. that time, housing, don't get me started. It's just <laughs> run into absolute ruin. We've been door knocking in um, all the public housing towers and people are just at their wits end. They're so they just feel completely abandoned by the state government. They're living in apartments that have had, you know, repairs sitting waiting for years. They can't get through to the housing office. Um there's no staff in the housing office. It's completely closed. They've been waiting a tra- for a transfer for 10 years for their, you know, kids. They're living in one-bedroom apartments with a big family. Mm. The last 24 hours has been really insightful as the kind of abandonment that our housing minister and the Labor government has kind of presided over. Mm. I got a call or I, I was chatting with a resident in public housing in Clifton Hill and she was like, oh, I don't know what to do. We've got this sewage problem. It's been like that for five years and we just, you know, we're all sick. Can you write a letter for me? So I wrote a letter and then she came back the next day and she's like, it's going to flood again. You know, we're expecting rain. What do I do? So I said, I'll come and have a look. And it was just the most appalling situation you could imagine. Like conditions. So this is like you- sewage waste leaking out of the sewage system. In between the flats and their garden, there's a concreted area and there's a mm. kid's playground. You literally have to step over shit to get mm. to the swings. Wow. Like, Jesus. Eight, like conditions you would not have expected in the last two centuries. Um, yeah. And underneath the house, just burst pipes and piles of sewerage and toilet paper. And they have called time and time and time again to get this problem fixed. And people turn up and say, I haven't got the right tools or, mm. you know, uh, like they just don't turn up or they get ignored. And you can see how, you know, how worried Labor are about losing this seat because I went with my, one of my volunteers who filmed a, a short video of some people talking and, and of the conditions there. We put it up um, and sent it to, it got sent to the minister's office, the housing minister's office, who's not um, Richard Wynne anymore because he's retiring. And mm. um, that got sent that evening and by 10 o'clock there was a plumber out there trying to hose it away next morning we came um i I came down on the site with a journalist 
and there were more plumbers there and there were three people in suits from the Department of Housing knocking on every door. Oh, sorry, it's taken so long. What can we do for you? <laughs> oh, my God. That's amazing. There you go. Really Greens, get shit done. There you go. Yeah, now, plus, exactly. That probably isn't anyone's fault. And if you blame anyone for that, then that, that would be really bad. But uh, yeah, we'll yeah, get to awful. that in a sec. But, but yeah. like, what a good uh, <laughs> example of what it might be like to have a Greens MP advocating on your behalf <laughs> in that area. Exactly. Yes. Imagine that. If you're living in the seat of the former housing minister or whatever, it's still not getting done, then yeah, fucking hell, maybe time to try something else. Yeah, Um, yeah. Gab, just really quickly, for people who aren't familiar um, and people outside of the state, obviously, and maybe maybe across Victoria too, just give us, can you give us the brief background of, of yourself, who you are, how you came to your politics and, and how you end up being the, the Greens candidate for this seat? Yeah, um, so I lived in the electorate for 20 years. I've been an artist for most of that time, um, but, um, you know, I've always worked in this area and fought for people in this area. As an artist, my art looked less and less like art and more like politics. <laughs> um, I was leading divestment movements from the fossil fuels industry and the immigration detention industry, then went into um, legal work and worked for refugee legal, advocating for refugees and asylum seekers. Yeah. Um, Just on that, people might remember, you were particularly crucial in the um, Sydney Biennale boycott when it was, was it Transfield at that point, was a major sponsor. People might remember this. George Brandis lost his fucking mind. But you were really involved in saying to artists, hey, we, sh- we can't support this kind of nonsense when this massive arts festival is being sponsored by people who are <laughs> profiting from the torture of innocent refugees. Yeah, so I was one of the artists in the exhibition and I made a work, I spent two years making an artwork and then found out a month before the show opened while I was shipping the work over to Cockatoo Island on a ferry mm. um, that, yeah, Transfield was the major sponsor and we kind of, yeah, tried to brainstorm different ways that we could respond to it but ultimately, like, there's nothing that justifies being associated with like or you know even supporting the immigration detention industry and the torture of Mm. refugees so I pulled my work out and over the next week or so we had nine artists that pulled their work out until the director of Transfield resigned and took his 11% share with him Mm. and this kind of effect snowballed with superannuation funds divesting huge public pressure on Transfield they had to change their name and logo they got sold out to a (laughs) um to like a Spanish company and then that company said very shortly afterwards that they would no longer service the immigration detention industry in Australia. Wow. So that got me started Mm. on like what am I, what am I actually doing? I'm making artwork about social change. I'm trying to change hearts and minds but how urgent are these situations that we're facing right now? And if I'm really interested in making an impact, if, if, if I'm trying to make a change, actually what do we have to do to make that change? What The most significant thing that I'd ever done as an artist was to actually not show my work. So what does that mean about, <laughs> about my effectiveness? <laughs> Brutal. <laughs> so, yeah, um, deci- like that set me on a bit of a like a different path and it got me to the point where I realised that I was always like, so as an activist, as an artist, as a paralegal, I was always trying to get someone else in a position of power to make a better decision Mm. when I knew that most of the people in those positions of power were not capable of making better decisions unless, you know, there was the greens breathing down their neck. (laughs) Yeah. And, of course, you were the mayor of the Arrow City Council, and this is just uh, my brief personal connection. So when I first joined the party in 2020 during the wackiness of COVID, I'm in living in Collingwood. I sign up to the Yarra branch, and we had the local council elections that that year in November or something like that, or yeah. September, November, something like that. And so I, yes, do what I can. I have no idea what the hell I'm doing. People give me some flies to put in letterboxes. I do that. A bunch of lovely people meeting on mind-numbingly boring Zoom meetings as we all were in 2020. <laughs> and then those local council elections go crazy and the Arrow City Council elects the first ever majority Greens government anywhere in the country in Australian history, which is which is pretty wild. Some say anywhere in the world, actually. Oh, shit. I think, I think every other Greens government has been a coalition. How in coalition. Yeah, there you right. go. Yeah. So I had a majority, so it was five out of the uh, the council. The council was very progressive era, traditionally very uh, progressive indeed, five Greens councils, two socialist councils indeed. And that was really exciting and really, uh, really cool. And then over the, the, the preceding couple of years has been reasons why the Arrow City Council has entered into the news headlines, which many would argue 
uh, weren't weren't for great reasons, I suppose. And there's there's a whole lot of bullshit, and we talk about this a lot on the show. A lot the way the media treats Greens, the way lots of people would want the first majority Greens government to fail. There was a lot of shit flying around, and I reckon just really briefly, could you reflect on and I give give us an idea of like how much of the bad stories that affected the Arrow City Council during your time while you're on there was um, confected and worth ignoring, and how much of it was like some things that weren't working properly in a part of the council. What are the lessons you learned from, from that mm. time? The, the, the biggest kind of overview I can give you, the like most succinct overview is that being the first ever Greens majority council in the world put a huge target on our backs. Yeah. Um, and what we saw from day one was kind of a deliberate program of undermining of kind of, you know, attacks of, you know, good old Greens bashing, as Paddy Manning put it. <laughs> You know, it was like oh, publishing uh, an unapproved report from a council officer and, you know, suddenly the Greens majority council are responsible for things that they would never approve, that we would never have approved. There was um, some pretty, actually some pretty really dirty kind of character assassination things that went on. And then, you know, after claiming, claiming that we'd been in the media too often, the minister, Labor minister decided that um, it would be a good time to put a monitor in, which, you know, is kind of a signal to the world that, that things are going wrong. But actually, mm. like in the scheme of things, we were functioning fine and the monitors just left and dropped a report that basically says, yeah, you've got some financial issues and, you know, there's some organisational things to fix up, but all in all, you're, you're pretty fine. Mm. Um, and, you know, it felt so big in the moment. Mm. But stepping out of it and seeing in retrospect the kinds of petty attacks that were being levelled at Yarra Council consistently just makes me see how incredibly scared um, our kind of political detractors are at the the rise of the Greens and the increasing power of the Greens Mm. um, and how desperate they are to hold on to a seat like Richmond, Mm. definitely seeing it in the context of this election. Um, yeah. And in fact, we achieved some incredible things while we were, you know, in that sh- in that short time between being elected in 2020 and now, this Greens Majority Council has just done so many amazing things that kind of just go in the shadows of these detra- distractions. So we we fought off private developers trying to grab up our public land. We locked in seven new green open spaces for the for the municipality. We transitioned 13 of our um, community centres off gas and onto 100% renewable energy and we've put in place a plan to transition our big community centres, our leisure centres and our our pools and our town halls off gas to be carbon neutral without offsets by 2030. And we've got a plan for the community to do the same as well. Mm -hmm. We launched our very first LGBTIQA plus strategy to protect and celebrate our community. We reformed our public drinking laws. They could go on and on. You know, we turned, we had the biggest program of outdoor dining, uh, turning car parks into outdoor dining spaces out of any municipality. Mm. And, you know, that's actually the legacy of the Greens in council. Mm. But a lot of the things that I felt frustrated at, you know, that we're working with a very small budget in a rate capped environment. We had a hostile Labor government not wanting to give us any kind of um, support to run out our programs. We've also got a planning system that's absolutely, that council is the face of, but it's absolutely run by the state government um, Mm. when it comes down to it. And it means that a lot of the tensions that we experience actually are systemic problems at the state level. Um, And Mm. that's one of the reasons why I want to step up into the state state government so that we can actually start to address some of those serious shortcomings that the state government has and that that they impose on local government level as well. So because I think as an outside observer particularly, I haven't been able to follow or just haven't seen a lot of the details of whatever scandals or attacks um, Yara City Council experienced. But I get the sense that one of the main charges is of nimbyism, right, which I feel is, I mean, local councils are necessarily engaged in local issues and I think more susceptible to that, like, nimbyism politics. I I guess, yeah, like, I, I'm curious to know how that happened, whether you think that there are any tensions that we as as a Greens movement need to work through lessons from that or whether 
how much of it is is just kind of a political attack from people who want to drive that perception of the Greens as saying no to everything. And I think this is this was particularly around, yeah, like the proposal to build housing on in public space that had a, a small proportion allocated for for public or affordable housing, but primarily would be like for developer profit, right? Yeah, yeah. So we we were we kind of inherited this project, which was about um, which was basically <laughs> proposing to give away one of the only chunks of council land to a private developer to build private apartments in exchange for like a handful of social of social units. Mm. Um, and it's about a fifth. So I've got this just from the Guardian fifth, article yeah. about it. So 200 units are going to be built on public land in Collingwood. One fifth would be social housing with some funding from the government. Is that a yeah, fair so it would be $28 million from the government, mm-hmm. $28 million to build like a That's, tiny amount of social housing, yeah. and we'd have to give the land, which was worth $20 million, to the developer. I mean, that, to me, it stunk. It did not stack up at all. And, you know, meanwhile, it's actually the responsibility of the state government to build public housing, mm. a responsibility that they have neglected for decades. And, you know, that's it was just not something that, that I could endorse, despite the fact that we need, or not despite, I mean, we need we need a whole lot of public housing. We need more affordable housing. And the Mm. Greens plan at the state level is a plan to address the housing crisis at all levels. And what we don't need is these new mega apartments, luxury buildings full of apartments for investors, which are just going to drive prices up. We need homes that are affordable for first home buyers. We need rental caps and stronger renters rights. And we need a massive build of public housing to be able to clear the wait list of 120,000 people on our public housing waiting list. So it was actually, yeah, more than because, yeah, like I said, from the outside, it comes across as, oh, this council, this Greens council is rejecting this public housing proposal because they don't want it there. Is that the case that like if it had actually just been a big build of public housing on that site, that would have been appropriate, like something that the council supported? Um. I think that I think that's much more likely. If if the state government has said, "Look, we want to build more public housing, and we want your we want the we want the council's land to do that," I don't mm. think we would have batted an eyelid to mm. to to giving away that that public land. Mm. Yeah, uh, you know, I think we need we need more public housing. This state government has no plans to build public housing. By the way, that's all yeah. privatized model. Um, mm. Well, that's fine. You don't have many people on the wait list anyway, do you, in Victoria? <laughs> yeah, just a, a few hundred thousand. Um, and the the state government owns hectares and hectares of land that's already built up, that's ready for public housing. You know, they they sold off five hundred and seventy eight hectares of land over a ten year period to private mm. developers. They've got a, a, almost a suburb's worth of public land in um, Fitzroy. Uh, it's called the Gasworks site, mm. and they have built a stadium and a school on it, which mm. in a little corner. The rest of it is going to be ninety percent given away to uh, sold to developers to build yeah. market rate apartments. Mm. Like, and that is public land. The mm. rest of it is going to be like this social and affordable housing, which is not public housing. Mm. It's, yeah. you know, still working with this private, private public partnership where rents will be high, where the tenants won't have security. Mm. It's just, it's not going to move the public housing waiting list. It's not enough and it's not secure enough. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you want to find out more about this, there was like a sort of, I guess, a summary of the case from The Guardian that, you know, put a bunch of people's voices forward, including yours, Gab, reflecting on the Greens' in, um, tenure as the uh, on the City Council of Yarra. We'll put that in the show notes if people are interested in reading more about that. But uh, but as I t- t- totally take your point that uh, the list of cool shit that the Greens does weirdly doesn't get in the papers as much as all strange, the bad, uh, bad shit. It's very strange. Let's talk about the campaign for Richmond. Uh, you're, so you're running against Lauren O'Dyer. As we said, Richard Wynne is retiring after a long time in the position. Uh, Lauren O'Dyer is running. Anything we should know about her as the Labor candidate putting her hand up? How's, how's it all going? Have you faced off in any debates yet? What's the deal with with Dimitri V. O'Dwyer? Uh, look, we did do a round of Paper, Scissors, Rock when we met for a coffee. Um, Who won? Oh. And, yeah. Fortunately, she won, but I think that's. Oh, I'll no. give her that. I'll give her Jesus that. Jesus Christ! 
<laughs> thing is, we're not leaving this this election. Hang on, up did to you chance. do best two out of three or no? No, we just did it once. Only one. Well, oh, one round doesn't count. count. Three. No, that's really, yeah, exactly. That that's count. like <laughs> just counting the the first the first booth or the something. The first pancake. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> um, what was the question again? <laughs> uh, how, who uh, is she? Uh, she yes. seems lovely. She seems lovely, but you know, she'll get into Parliament and she'll vote to keep rents high and she'll vote to. Keep yeah. drilling near the twelve apostles. Yes, those <laughs> not, things. That's not that lovely. <laughs> yeah, so don't vote for her. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. that's the official serious danger position to allow <laughs> Richmond listeners. Don't vote for her. I was taken by this. Richard Wynn is still. He's on his way out, but he's still. He's still. You know, digging in. Still throwing a few bombs over his shoulder. In his valedictory speech to Parliament, he described the Greens thusly: "What a sad way to practice politics. To be always in the grandstand, never on the field of play, where the real work is done and the real." Progress won. Ooh, very wow. catty. He's, he's yeah, but you know they won't admit that you know so many of their progressive reforms actually started their lives as Greens policy. Of course, they won't admit that Ellen Sandal first brought a bill to end mandatory gas connections to Parliament. Mm-hmm. Two weeks later, they brought their own. <laughs> Uh, they won't say that the renters' reforms that they introduced in 2017, kind of coincidentally around the time that um, Lydia Thorpe was about to um, take Northcote, mm. they wouldn't yeah. say that that was a Greens um, a Greens idea that, that that the Greens and the community had been asking for 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 years. They won't say that the donations reforms that they introduced were a Greens idea. They quietly take up our ideas and they put them forward as their own, which is fine. That's what we're there for. And this most <laughs> recent announcement about um, a publicly owned energy retailer. It's great yeah. news. Yeah. It's but pretty it wild, started yes. its life as a as a Greens policy. That's that's literally one of our top line um, yeah. energy policies. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And now what we want them to see, what we want to see them do is stop drilling for gas and end our coal-fired power stations. <laughs> Mm. Yes, please. Hopefully, yes, <laughs> that will be. I don't, I don't know. Is is the Andrews Labor government again using the Greens? Sometimes again using the Greens by pinching policies or by moving to their left to outflank the Greens. And clearly, the Greens are serious threats. Obviously, in Richmond, um, also in other seats like uh, like Northcote and Albert Park. Um, but are they also using the Greens as like, a, hey, we're not as crazy as these guys. We're not as ridiculously as outlandish and sort of punching left as they, as they are sometimes want to do, to use the Greens as the crazy alternative and present themselves as the sensible, mm. centrist um, alternative. They don't comment on our policies. If they comment on us, it's like very personal attacks. I think they're trying to look more and more like the Greens. I think they're just, you know, they're, which is exactly why we're there. That's actually great. You know, we want them to be scared about losing these seats so that they take a good hard look at themselves mm. and start implementing the progressive policies that these, that, you know, that Victorians voted for like never before in the federal election and they're going to vote mm. for the, for those, again, for progressive politics in the state election. In the federal election, what was the increase in the Senate vote in Victoria? That is a good question that I will have to get back on to you. I think it was about a yeah, 3% swing in, yeah, increase, right. which, again, of course, is all funny with the, you know, Lydia Thorpe is not what Victorians voted for. It's like, well, yeah. she is because people, is. <laughs> more people than ever voted uh, for the Greens of the Senate in Victoria mm-hmm. and wanted more of that, please. So mm-hmm. you don't know what you're talking about. So, yes, that was across across the state. It was, uh, yeah, 2 or 3% swing, I think, to the party. Yeah, wow. And those attacks on Lydia Thorpe are clearly, clearly an attempt to keep Northcote, keep mm-hmm. the Greens out of Northcote. Yeah, yeah, really. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, Interesting. yeah. Yeah. More greens means no new coal and gas. It means affordable homes for all, and it means holding the next government to account. Your vote is powerful. Vote one, greens. I want to get into like the uh, just to, to finish up, Gavin. This has been great. Thanks very much for your time. But really quickly, before we jump into this last article that amuses very much, that might give us an idea into some of the campaign strategy going on in Richmond for your campaign. Two really quick things that have been announced that I know that like you're really passionate about that it might be worth it could be really interesting to other Greens members across the country about stuff that the Victorian Greens are putting out there. Can you tell us really quickly about the artist living wage and the reproductive leave that the Victorian Greens have announced some policies this election? Yeah. Um, so the artist living wage is one of our suite of um, new arts policies um, in our 
arts everywhere for everyone policy. Um, the artist living wage is something we're putting forward as a trial for 2,000 artists over three years to give them a living wage, which at the moment is $42,200. We've been hearing, and as an artist myself, experiencing how just how difficult it is to make ends meet as an artist, um, even though our economy relies on us to the tune of 7% of our Victorian economy and 8.8% of our workforce is employed in creative industries. Um, So our artists need supporting. We're going to, you know, end up in 10 years without a kind of Victorian kind of contemporary culture if we continue to like cut funding and undermine our artists. And they suffered like, they suffered a lot during the pandemic. Um, So this is kind of in recognition of the the stability that they need and the freedom that they need to be able to actually create the work that we all rely on and that we all love and that actually feeds our bigger institutions, which I think get a lot of funding, but our small to medium and our and our individual independent artists don't actually get the support they need to be able to create the work. So yeah, three year pilot program is what we'll be pushing for. How do you pick nice. the two thousand artists? So it would be a non-competitive process. So it's not like a grant round where you have to like prove your worth and prove that you're better than the next person. It won't be available for everyone because it is a trial, but it would be about having some criteria that just to prove that you are a practicing artist, whether it's a, you know, visual artist or a theater maker or a writer or a Comedian. um, comedian or a musician. Absolutely. Yes. Well, the, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, great. More money for artists, particularly comedians and podcasters. That's what I took away from that particular policy. That's a good one. Yeah. Reproductive leave as well. This is a great scheme announced. This is, uh, again, something for the public spe- sector employees in Victoria that Victorian Greens are running on. An yeah. additional five days of reproductive health and well-being leave to access IVF and endometriosis treatments, contraception procedures, abortion, hysterectomies, you know, stuff that people need. Um, uh, for their reproductive health, that would be really good. It's and gender affirming care as well. Gender affirming also be used if you're suffering a miscarriage or, or menopause symptoms or something like that. All fantastic stuff. And announced just this week, Gab, you're telling me a new. You love this emerald four day week trial. Tell us four about day it, week. baby. Yep, four day week. Four day so week. four day working week, um, fifth day to you know look after your veggie patch or do a bit of self-care or spend time with the family do a podcast because that's what i do with my day <laughs> off <laughs> or do a podcast do a podcast yep. um, which will hopefully be paid for under our art scheme of yeah. uh, full living mm. wage so you won't have to take a day off it's to do it right for me. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah it's a 60 million dollar trial across the public and the private sector so we'd work with unions to uh to kind of work out how to implement the public sector part of it. And then the private sector would be grants to small to medium businesses so that they can transition a whole workforce to four days without any loss of pay or entitlements. And then a proportional increase in uh, or decrease in work days or equivalent increase in wage for people who are already on part-time wages, which are usually, you know, uh, um, women or people with other responsibilities. So we don't want them to miss out in the process. Um, and obviously it's because everyone's exhausted and we've got no work-life balance and we're all kind of overworked and underpaid and a four-day work week just makes sense. <laughs> and and it's like, I know it's like an annoying point to make because this shouldn't be the issue or it shouldn't be the major concern, but all the trials that have been enacted prove that productivity actually increases, that people it makes people happier and healthier and have a better relationship to work and therefore a better little worker ants. I mean, I know that's not the way <laughs> to sell it, but I suppose, of course, the immediate response is, oh, the productivity slump that will result from this uh, can easily be counted by the actual facts of how these things work out. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the increase in well-being alone, it just the, the flow on effect is an increase in productivity. And if that's what matters to you, well, we win that argument too. Yeah. yeah damn right. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we are going to be pushing for that and we know that actually like the Labor membership really wants it as well. There was a um, kind of a leak a couple of weeks ago as well saying that they were um, pushing for it too. So we reckon that, you know, there's going to be some a little crack there to, to put, really push hard for this. Great. All right, we, uh, we're going to wrap up um, in a sec, but it would be very remiss of us if we did not just touch on one article from the beautiful folks at Nine Fairfax that was looking at the Richmond campaign and about the fact that you guys brought in the big guns, MP Max Chandler-Mather, 
the mastermind behind the Greens' remarkable federal election success in Queensland this year. Uh, you brought him in to train up uh, Greens volunteers across these these three winnable seats, Albert Park, Northcote and Richmond. Were you there on the day, Gab? Did you get to see the master at work up close? I was and I did. We got to kind of workshop a few different scenarios at the door and we actually had three hours of training and then we all went out for a massive door knock. We had people, like 50 people out knocking on doors in Richmond afterwards. It was great. Very high energy, lots of people absolutely swooning over the mastermind. Um, <laughs> and it, like he really powered up our campaign, like yeah. really skilled us up, but also just bumped up that energy and that feeling like we're going to win. I, Tom, like I literally just got the headline to this article. Right. The, the article headline is Green's Eye Maximum Success. Oh, boy. That's Max's name in the word maximum. <laughs> I get it now. Such a smart pun. Really so good. Funny. This is Annika <laughs> Smithhurst um, and her take. This, there's a lot going on in this article that we need to touch on. First of all, it's sort of leading with not necessarily the fact that you got Max to help in with the Victorian election, but he's sort of saying that I guess this is a direct quote where Max talked to her saying that green supporters can be a bit preachy and that we shouldn't fulfill the stereotype of being a moralizing lefty. So he says that's the status quo, but he would like yeah. to change that. Now, that's not totally wrong, right? That's something we've chatted about on the show before, Emerald, that this is a perception of the Greens and that's something that we want to avoid and hopefully the success of the Queensland Greens is trying to circumvent or negate that perception of us as the party. Is that fair? You asking me? Absolutely. I yes. feel like I talk about this a lot. I feel like I talk about, yeah, the idea that people think that we hate them and we think that they're that we're better than them. And that's what they may expect when we knock on their door. I also think that even though that is a massive um, barrier to success and something that we need to overcome, it's kind of an opportunity because people are so surprised when we <laughs> contradict that expectation. And so literally all it takes is us being like, oh no, actually I totally get what you're saying. And they're like, whoa. Whoa. And that can be a big um, moment of change. <laughs> Are you finding that gap because, and again, you know, I'm saying this with all love and respect, it is easy to understand how some people might view yourself as an artist, a lady who wears green, green glass, green frame glasses sometimes, <laughs> um, who lives in an inner, inner suburban seat. You know, you could be easily painted as uh, the stereotypical Greens candidate and people might have a bunch of presumptions about you and your politics and how you go about things. Is that something that you've thought about during your campaign or something you have to try and tackle? Yeah, sure. I mean, as a headline, like artist and activist doesn't do much for many people and, you know, you've only got a few seconds to go, no, no, like I've done some really like meaningful stuff and, you, you know, it's, it's actually not, it's not helpful. Like it, you actually have to have those conversations one-to-one -one and mm. demonstrate that you're a real person and listen to people's problems and, and connect politics with their real life. And I think that that's why we've found door knocking has been so effective because people get to understand that you are a real a real person. I'm a local. Um, there's people out there who, who know me, who can vouch for me, and that's what having like a massive volunteers out on the street does. Mm. Um, and, you know, I, I also think that there's a lot of people that I've there's a lot of people in my community, whether it's the artist community, whether it's the public housing community, whether it's the community that rose up against the East West link in the 2014. Like I have a long history of um, activism in this area. And so people do know that there's a lot more dimensions than a 20 word byline. Yeah. <laughs> but I hope that you're not using any of these voters on the doors campaign or like their anger to campaign, right? Because <laughs> that's, you know, if you talk to someone and they say that they're angry at the way that they've been let down by politicians and the government, the correct response is you're wrong. You're Calm wrong. down. We can't have everything at once. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> um, that's what I understand, right, from this quote in the article from our fave, Harry Butler, <laughs> who says that the Greens are very good at conflating the two major parties because they campaign on anger. Yes. People are angry, though. You know, like, I yes, don't think exactly. that that's right. People exactly. are so angry. <laughs> they're seeing people at the top getting richer and richer and they're struggling, yeah. like, more and more people are struggling. What's not to be angry about? We're seeing, yeah. like, our oh, Gabrielle, two major... Gabrielle, Gabrielle, Gabrielle. <laughs> Your audience so innocent, don't so need naive. to hear this. <laughs> 
<laughs> it, this is yeah. incredible, right? So they, they, they talk about Max coming to um, to help out on these campaigns and give some tips, run some workshops. Uh, the polling suggests that the Greens are going to do very well and Gab will be the next uh, MP for Richmond, all going well. It says here uh, that you will win the seat next month by pursuing anti-government sentiment. And then they <laughs> talk to two federal MPs who... <laughs> seem to only get a call now to talk to the media about how they lost to the oh, Greens. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's like their new, their new angle. And they do bring in Terry Butler, of course, who lost in Griffith and says that, yes, um, this campaigning technique works because if you're angry and you want to blame someone, it's easy to convince voters that parties of government are the problem. They see us because all as one thing. Is it, wasn't great. that actually Max Chandler Mather's line like there's no difference between yeah. labor and liberal like she's just boosting his campaign but, and also that's not a line that max made up no. that's a line that we started using and recognizing as one of the most common things that voters would say to us yes. on the doors yes like that's the thing that yeah this disconnect for people like terry butler like people in labor and in the lnp that they think that the greens are just like making this shit up because they've never actually asked anyone and if some if a voter tells them this they're just like oh that's just a mean stupid voter that one i don't like yeah like no <laughs> uh, former liberal mp trevor evans who lost his seat of brisbane to the greens in may as well owned believes the major parties have been hesitant to criticize the greens in the past over fears that doing so will legitimize the threat. By doing oh. so, Evans said the Greens have been able to outbid major parties on policy promises without being accountable as they won't they weren't a yeah. party of government. <laughs> Is that why the Greens have had a success? Because the Labor and Liberal haven't criticized us. Yes. No, yeah. that's I the see. only yeah. reason. That's the only yeah. possible explanation I can see. If we look check this quote out. If we're seeing the slow breakdown of the two parties, it will be it will be increasingly important to start to criticize other alternatives. So n- not to improve the major parties. We can't be, get any better whatsoever. That would just be out of the question. Yeah. We can't look at our own uh, no. campaigning techniques or the kind of ideas that we're presenting to people or our connection with ordinary voters. No, 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 no. We need to get better at hanging shit and terrifying people about these alternative parties like the Greens who are presenting ideas that people like. That's simply got to be the way we go. Mm-hmm. That is outrageous. <laughs> But I guess the, the, the question is, like, is anti-government sentiment a part of your campaign? Are you able to campaign against either the Andrews government, the Labor Party, the lack of action, um, what the Andrews government is failing to do despite its, you know, massive popularity and 11-seat majority in in Parliament? How is how is that rolling out? Are you, are you um, capitalising on stoking people's anger at the status quo? I think it's less anti-government sentiment as it is apathy. Like lots of people have lost Mm -hmm. confidence in politics. They've lost confidence in this idea that their representatives should be representing them. And we're hearing that a lot at doors. And there's this kind of like undercurrent of lack of integrity, of lack of accountability. um, And that kind of just smears over the whole parliament. Um, And so I think that that's a really important discussion point for us because the reason why we need a stronger cross bench is to be able, and f- filled with Greens um, MPs is to hold them to account and to push for, for, for further electoral reforms and donations reforms and to make sure that they're not lining the pockets of their, you know, gas corporation mates and their gambling lobby mates and their property developer mates. Like those are mm. the things that will reinstill a sense of confidence in in politics. So yes, we are campaigning on that. Definitely. (laughs) I think that as an undercurrent is a good way to explain it, right? Because sometimes like I am critical of, for example, if, if we're talking about, you know, what are our big issues this election, I'm critical of naming integrity as, as an issue itself. And I noticed I was, I was reading the nine Fairfax stories about their polling that they did to determine the big issues for the electorate in the upcoming Victorian election And they frame it as integrity being the number one issue. But it's actually just that integrity is the most commonly commonly named issue as something that's kind of important to everyone or to everyone, you know, to about half of the people that they they asked. Mm. Whereas, yeah, if you ask people to name one thing, the most important priority issue, it's cost of living, Mm. like fairly predictable, right? 
And so for me, it's like, yeah, that kind of undercurrent of, of anti-political sentiment of the idea that you can't trust politicians, that is the, the politics, the, the, ex, the explanation for why you don't have the things that you care about. Yeah. And so, yeah, you, you know, to, to, come, to go to an election saying, well, we need more housing, we need more relief for, for power bills, you know, we need a better healthcare system, all of these things that will actually make a difference in, in people's lives. And the reason you won't get that from the major parties is because they are you know, bought and sold to these these uh, big corporations. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's, yeah, that's the, the current. So I like that as, as a framing, I think. Yeah, it's like yeah. if the system had integrity, stuff would work, right? Politics would actually be yeah. responsive to people's needs. And it's completely understandable that people say, look, I don't know all the details. I'm not particularly invested in, you know, the, the liberal democratic tradition and the, the beauty and integrity of our political system. I just want stuff to work and I want what the people yeah. want to have happen to actually happen. So, yes, get the fucking mm. money out of politics, drain the swamp even, <laughs> a catch cry at the Trump campaign, you know, do something to shake up this system where clearly rich people and corporations have far too much influence and a grip on on our on our politics at the state and federal level. I think that's yeah. totally reasonable for people. To- and I think that people don't um, necessarily know the details. They know that there's, you know, a, a crisis of integrity um, mm. across yeah. all the things that they care about and all the pressures that they're feeling. But when you highlight to them, well, did you know that they take, you know, Liberal and Labor both take donations from the gambling industry? Did you know that they take donations from property developers? People are really surprised and something kind of clicks into place. Mm. Um, a final question also in this article was talking about the way that dirt has been used in 2018. There was some extremely grubby shit that went down that basically sunk some Greens campaigns, including, you know, bringing up some rap lyrics from one Greens candidate from ages ago that don't represent his current views that he apologised for, but Labor went extremely hard on. And there is talk in this article that, you know, uh, the stories around Lydia Thorpe will be used. Several Labor MPs speaking to the age on the condition of anonymity to discuss campaign matters said the latest revelations that Thorpe, now a Green senator, had failed to declare a possible perceived conflict of interest in her relationship with Dean Martin would again be used to highlight some cultural problems within the party. Lydia Thorpe still has issues here, one Labor MP said. When they deserve it, holding them to account is important. So just openly telling the media, yes, we're going to use these perceived ideas of conflict of interest for a federal senator here in this state election campaign, something that has no, you know, policy content whatsoever, no real relationship to ordinary people's lives, but we will happily capitalise on these smears and use them as as much as possible. I'd be interested in your thoughts on that, Gab, and whether, you know, some dirty shit has yet to come out in in the Richmond campaign as far as you can see. Yeah, um, well, we're seeing we're seeing them try to do that. Um, I've been knocking on doors every day in the last three or four weeks, so I've got a good sense of how things are landing. And honestly, it hasn't come up. I think one of my volunteers had it come up, and the the feeling that they got was actually she admitted to making a mistake. Mm. There were consequences. Let's move on. This is actually, mm. you know, this is how integrity works. Um, you actually kind of work through problems. You admit to it, and uh, you know, like I, I don't, I don't see this being a big problem. I think most of people recognise this for the beat up that it is. Mm. It's kind of out of control. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't think any of your old art is going to be brought out as an example of you being <laughs> a crazy communist hippie or something from from ten years ago or something. Maybe, but I reckon voters in this electorate will, uh, you know, will love it. So <laughs> I'm not worried. <laughs> It'll boost you. That's great. It's like, you know, when that um, video of AOC dancing yeah, came yes. out and the person who leaked it thought it was just going to be the most salacious thing that she was like <laughs> lip syncing and sexy dancing around the uni and actually it just like boosted her profile not that like i'm i've got the kind of like kudos and sexiness of um of aoc in any of my artwork but you know maybe a similar kind of minor minor version of that (laughs) yeah i reckon i think you're gonna be just fine mate um gab for richmond.com.au that is the website if you're in the area obviously please vote for gabrielle or check it out with more policies and vote greens that'd be very nice but obviously volunteers always needed always beloved always valued if you can lend time or a little bit of money you can always donate as well if you can help out with this campaign this is a real chance for the greens as is northcote and albert park on november 26th the state election if 
fuck, if you won those three seats and held the three lower house ones we already had, plus picked up, you know, uh, some more in the um, the upper house, joining Samantha Ratnam up there, that would be a pretty extraordinary boost for the party and would have a serious impact on the next Victorian state parliament where we could do some really, really cool shit. So go to gabsrichmond.com.au. Um, every single day is a day of action between now and election day. Um, but, uh, yeah, people should obviously reach out and, and help out where they can. Uh, you know, we've got 250 shifts of door knocking to fill between now and the election. So, and there's something for everyone as well if door knocking's not your thing. You know, we've got envelope stuffing if that's your thing. So, please <laughs> um, show up. It's a really fun campaign to be on, and you can feel the energy. Our campaign office is on Smith Street in Collingwood. So, drop in or um, give us a call. It's so exciting. I haven't had campaign energy for a while personally, but I can like feel it through the phone. <laughs> oh, awesome. <I> love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good luck to you, Gab. Thanks so much Thank for your time. You so Appreciate much. it. This is a serious danger to Australia.